so much for having me tonight. I am Sihle Popwana from Rhodes University in South Africa. Um, I was actually supposed to be there in Valencia with all of you who are in the conference hall tonight. But unfortunately, I had issues with my visa and I had to um, cancel my plans last minute. But I am very happy that I still get the opportunity um, to share my presentation with all of you um, for my research, even if it's just um, only online. Um, I've been listening to the, to the presentations today. They've been very um, nice and informative. And um, what sparked my interest the most is particularly the ones that are focusing on um, enhancing production um, yields, which um, in, in South Africa, we, we have an issue of arable field abandonment or agricultural land abandonment, if you will, whatever term you want to call it. So um, it, it begs, and it's not it's not only an issue in South Africa, but globally as well as we're going to see as we go down my presentation. So this begs the question: Then, if um, we have all these methods, at what scale are we going to apply them? Is it only at commercial scale, are we then not leaving small scale farmers behind? And considering that small scale farmers are very important, especially for food security of a country because they go down to household level and community level. So um, it, it, small scale farming actually ensures that the country is safe at lower levels as well, which is where my research is stemming from. I am doing research on arable field abandonment. I'm mainly evaluating social effects of arable field abandonment in communal areas of South Africa. And in South Africa, we have communal areas in um, urban settings, but this research is mainly focusing on the ones that are in the rural areas because that's where most of the farming usually occurs because there's land, unlike in, in cities where there's not enough space because there's like over, um, people are over, um, populate, there's overpopulation, so there's not enough space to, to do farming. So um, for my research, I am going to give um, background and study rationale as to why this research was conducted. And then I'll touch on the objectives and research questions. And then I'll give um, a little bit of background on the conceptual framework that was used for the study. And then the methodology findings, and then I'll conclude. Um, first, um, let's start by defining what is arable field abandonment. So arable field abandonment is the cessation of cultivating or cropping for active cultivation of land for several years, such that um, the land is left bare um, long enough for it to start, um, for revegetation to start occurring. And then you start observing grass and trees and shrubs and in some cases that land might end up being replaced by other land uses because it's been left abandoned for too many years and then the population in the villages or in the communities it increases and then people start using that space for something else because it's not used and then sometimes if it's um, left unused for too long and depending on the practices that um, the extensiveness of the management practices that were there before, the land might also start to erode if it's left bare for too many years. So as I've said that arable field abandonment is not only um, a phenomenon that is experienced in South Africa, but globally as well. Um, it, it is said that um, globally arable land abandonment has, it has emerged in the, early, in the early 20th century and um, has been there through the 1950s and approximately 1.47 million square kilometers of agricultural, agricultural land has been abandoned globally. And just to give um, a few examples, in Europe, approximately 1.29 million hectares were recorded abandoned. In the mountainous areas of China, 28% of arable land was also recorded abandoned. And between 1980 and 2004, 
in Nepal, about 47% of land, arable land, had been recorded abandoned. And in Japan as well, statistics have shown that um, agricultural land use has declined from 6 million hectares to, to 4.5 million hectares. And other areas that are experiencing um, high levels of ab abandonment include Australia, South America, and Africa. So in South Africa, we have we do have several studies that have um, that that have um, shown decline in arable field abandonment, and th they have also shown that there's a reduction in the land area dedicated to field cropping. And what this means is 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 what I was just talking about now that. Um, the land is left bare for several years, and then, then other land uses, um, the land starts being used for other land uses, and then if in future the people would want to take on cultivation as well, then the land that would be available to them would be less than the land that was initially there back when they stopped cultivating. So we do have Anger and Fox on their study that was conducted in 2000, who showed that 49%, um, who showed that there was a 49% decline in the area of um, field cultivated in Nompa village. And then Faye in 2015 also observed a decrease in the number of household cultivating fields in the Hobeni village. And Kono and Twana in 2018 found that 90% of respondents in three villages of Lu, Lu Tengele, Sikhotlini, and Bekweni areas also abandoned their fault. And then Shackleton and Hepik added that agricultural production has been declining in South Africa since the 1940s. So why are we concerned about um, arable fault abandonment? In South Africa, this is because Back in the early years, your 1970s, farming was generally the main source of income in rural areas. And farmers, we, they could sell their produce at local markets. They were, they, they were stable. And then, however, currently, households now base their livelihoods on diverse sources of income, including government social grants and um, wage incomes. And these are unstable because wage income is usually very little. And sometimes if someone loses their employment, then they get plunked back to poverty in that household. Or the, the way our government social grant works is that it's pensions, which is usually received by people that are over 65. So a few years later, when that person dies and they're not there anymore, then the household is not going, going to have um, someone who's bringing in income or when it comes to the children's social grants, if you, you can only get it up until you are 18 years old, and then if the child grows older, then you, you won't have any income in your household. So land-based um, income streams, they're still considered very important in South Africa. This is because, like I've just mentioned now, of farm sources of income, which is your wages, or your salary, they are usually inadequate um, to cover all household expenses, and and this renders households unstable. And um, farming can can be used in these cases as a safety net, if you will. So rural communities in South Africa are also typically underdeveloped in terms of infrastructure and um, government services and employment. So it's, it's very hard for them to get services brought to them. So it would be very good if they could um, produce their own food in their own communities rather than having to travel to, to towns to buy when the roads are not even good and it costs more to go to town because um, their infrastructure is not good. So in light of this, farming has been proven to improve food security of households in the absence of wage income and other services in rural areas. However, um, there has been a decline in farming um, the decline has been observed in livestock production as well, but it has been more pronounced in um, production of crops um, as rural areas have um, 
abandoned, but some people, even though they have abandoned the larger fold, they have moved to home gardens cultivation. So um, the study rationale is that cultivation in rural areas contributes to agricultural stability and food security. It maintains biodiversity and rural landscapes. It gives a sense of belonging and identity to the people in the rural areas. And it is also one of the SDG goals for reducing poverty and, product and protecting life on land. And it also stabilizes ecosystems. However, with field cultivation declining, this poses a risk for all of these that I've just mentioned, stabilizing ecosystems, um, ensuring food security, the SDG goals not to be met. So it is essential, therefore, to conduct research that will seek to inform the reasons behind diminish diminishing food cultivation and therefore the consequences in communal areas of South Africa even though we do have pro-agricultural policies in the country. So this research, it, it, it must be undertaken at appropriate spatial and temporal scales, which will include knowledge from the ground with long-term analysis. Moreover, it is also important to evaluate which factors, which actors are most affected by agricultural land abandonment. Is it the small-scale farmers who have discontinued farming? Um, their household or their, their agricultural supply companies because this means that if people are no longer cultivating the, the agricultural suppliers in their towns, they're no longer getting customers to buy from them. And um, increasing field cultivation in the rural areas of South Africa, it can be used in a strategy against the high levels of poverty and food security. So um, the main aim of the study was to identify analyze and determine social effects of arable field abandonment in the study areas. And um, objective one was to identify any trends in, in, in field cultivation. And this does not speak only to declines, but we also wanted to see if maybe there's been recultivation as well. So we wanted to see um, the situation. So the research, question that we asked for this objective was how had land use changed over the last 50 years and research question number two was how has the participation rate in field cultivation changed over the last 50 years in the study areas so objective number two was to compare livelihood stra strategies of farming households with those who have given up agriculture so we wanted to see if you used to cultivate before and then now we go to your household and then you're telling us that you're not cultivating anymore. So what what have you observed? Has there been any change? Is it a positive or a negative change? Would you want to go back to cultivation or you think that you are better off without it? You are moving on with the times and yeah. And then the research question that we asked was how has field abandonment or establishment change livelihood strategies. So the conceptual framework that I used for the study was the DPSIR framework, which is driver pressure, state impact and response. So for this study, the drivers were the ecological drivers, which is your wildlife and your, your livestock, which would sometimes raid people's food and then which, which would eventually lead them to stop cultivating because it would all be a waste if they would just plow and plant and then everything get destroyed. And we also um, looked at remittances and social grants, which is um, off farm sources of income. Because sometimes when people get these, they don't see the need why they now need to cultivate because they feel like we can buy food for our household then they, they become lazy to farming. So then the pressure becomes filled abandonment. And this pressure becomes, ex it, it gets exerted on the, on the environment as well as human um, livelihoods. So the state, um, it changes in land use in rural areas. They have consequences for the natural environment and also the rural livelihoods. As I've said, that people may become poorer, and then in the environment, um, there might be revegetation, which people might not want. 
but in other cases they might want it and um, in other cases there may be soil erosion so then the the, the state of the environment and the people changes and um, the the impact in many cases the altered state of the environment has an impact on the society because now if we used to to make food and now it's just grass and trees then it means that we it, it has a negative impact on on our food security as um a village or a community so um a response it could be by society or policy makers which would um come from them from evaluating the drivers and the impact and then come up with policies targeted responses that would um change the situation and maybe um limit the the pressure or the drivers for the people to recultivate again if they think that cultivation is good for them so um in south africa we have nine provinces and for this research we conducted it in two provinces which is the eastern cape and the KwaZulu Natal. So the, the study areas we selected with the assistance from the Eastern Cape of an agricultural advisor who was working with the communities around the Eastern Cape. And then they um, um, pointed us to the communities that were previously actively cultivating but have um, ceased or there has been a decline and then in KwaZulu Natal we were liaising with the community forester she also advised on the same on the communities that she observed that used to be actively cultivating but now have stopped and um, these are just the shapes of the um, villages these ones are in Eastern Cape and these ones in KwaZulu Natal so the methodology that we used um, for question one, we used aerial photographs to see the change. And I know that I said that we, we wanted to observe the change over 50 years, but um, we couldn't get aerial photographs for that go as early as 50 years for those villages. So we, we only um, managed to get for 20 years. And then um, also, we also used um, household interview for the for the first question is we just randomly chose households we would go there and um, do our interviews but from those ones we then selected all those ones that said we used to cultivate but have now stopped so we targeted those ones to to get to see the impact that um, having stopped cultivation might have had on their households so um I hope this is visible, but this is um, the results of our analysis, GIS analysis. So if we're looking at that uh, on the on the first one, which is 2000, the, the one written communal land is um, agricultural communal land, which is what the community was using to um, do the cultivation. So if we're looking at 2000, we can see that, unfortunately, I couldn't um, detect the, the, the parts that are still active, but we, we will see as we go that it, it shows that people are no longer cultivating because in 2000, we see that we have more communal land. And then as we go to 2013, that communal land is starting to be replaced by rangelands now, which means that grass is starting to grow there. And then as you go along, you, you are also observing um, natural vegetation as well, which, which is your tribes and your trees. And then it is the same case in um, 2022. We also see that communal land is becoming even less, and then we're getting more rangelands, we're getting more residential area, and then we're getting more um, natural vegetation. So this is the table that shows the change. So if we're looking between 2000 and 2013, we can see that the residential area um, on the, if, if we're looking on the change column in hectares there, we can see that for the residential area between 2000 and 2013, there's been an increase of 1.1 hectares, while homestead gardens have decreased by 6.1 hectares. And then the rangelands have um, increased 
meaning now the communal lands are starting to be replaced by rangelands. And then we see that communal lands are decreasing there by 20.6, and then natural vegetation has increased by 9.7, all of those are in hectares. And then if we're looking at between 2013 and 2002, we are also seeing there um, that residential between those two years increased by 0 0.3, while um, homestead gardens decreased by 0 0.8, and then rangelands decreased by 0 0.8, and then rangelands um, increased by 60.5 and communal land decreased by 82.8 while natural vegetation increased by 22.8. So um, we, we, we saw that people are not cultivating as much anymore. So um, we went and we wanted to find out the reasons behind them not um, cultivating as much anymore. And from the household interviews, we found that that um, the people, the head of the household would be saying, I'm older now, um, I, I, I don't have the physical capacity to do the uh, work that is required with farming and then the youth of the household is not interested. And then in South Africa around the 19, um, 1930s, we had a betterment planning. Betterment planning, what it did is it separated the residential area. Before people used to live in very um, large area, you'd have your house and then you'd big land here, and then you'd have your trial in the, in the same space. But then betterment planning came and then now the residential area was on this side and then the folds were, were put on the other side overlooking the the residential area. So now the distance was increased between the households and the field. And then that was another complaint from the um, respondents that, you know, the distance, it, it's too much, I'm older, can't work it anymore. And then also the gender of the household. A lot of households were female-headed households, about um, over 60%. The female-headed household and females have a lot of um, duties to do within the household. They have so many chose to um, attend to, so they don't have time to go and, and work in the field because you'd find that it's either they widowed or the husband works in a city and they come once in a while and then the females just don't have time. And then with the economic drivers, people stated that they don't have fencing. This was a big issue across all the villages because um, they had said that um, with the issue of wildlife and livestock, it, it doesn't help to cultivate when you don't have a fence. And because the communal fields are very large, they also don't have money to, to do their own fencing for themselves because um, it was very costly. So yeah, and then there was also lack of oxen because there's been a decline in um, livestock and also machinery was very expensive for them because they were mostly dependent on social grants, even though they were those that way working, but most of them, it was just social grant or farm um, employment was very low. And then also they had um, alluded that the production costs um, were, were expensive for them. And then there was an issue of environmental drivers. South Africa has been experiencing a lot of, um, in 2015 to 16, there was a national state of drought that was declared, um, particularly in the Eastern Cape and some parts of Pazulu Natal as well, which were the provinces that the study were conducted. So people, because these, the, the communal fields are mostly rain fed. So um, there's that issue that if it doesn't rain at the time when it's supposed to rain, then um, all your work will go to waste. And then from 2020, 2021, 2022, we've been experiencing extreme floods. It's, it, it's been bad with floods and mostly in these two provinces as well, of Eastern Cape and Basul Natal. So that's been an issue. And like I've alluded to shortage of water, they don't have um, irrigation systems in those areas. So even if you do have enough water, 
but it's, if it doesn't rain, if it's a drought, you can't um, take that water to their to their fields. And then there was an issue of distance to to the fields like that I've already alluded to. And then the consequences, um, I've divided them into as well economic, social, and health consequences. And the economic consequences with that. Um, they had the respondents alluded that the household economic status became very unstable after they had abandoned food because now they only dependent on the social grant and then it doesn't even stretch enough to cover all household need and you you find that they have to worry about um stress about food before it is the month end and they're able to get another um, payout from the government. So they it, it became very unstable for them. And then this increased their dependence on social grants. And then of farm sources of income, these ones were not adequate at all. And then unfulfilled employment prospects. This one talks to um, and there's, there's um, a high unemployment in South Africa, and then if um, you find people that they're not cultivating, it means that they're there, they are available to go and look for jobs somewhere else. But this didn't work because it, it's not going to be fulfilled because there's no employment in the country, like it's very scarce. So they just, they, they are available, but they can't do anything. And then with the social consequences, um, these ones, we had that within the households, the elderly felt that there was a change in the power relationships between um, the parents and the children. They felt that they can't really um, command their kids to do house chores or work in the gardens because it's not like before when it was a thing that you wake up at 4 a.m you go to the fields you know that you're going to be there working now things have changed because cultivation is not there anymore the parent is doing their own thing the child is doing their own thing and the parents they also felt that there was a there was loss of respect from the youth and this was caused by the disconnect of not working together and for them it was different they grew up knowing every day you wake up at four during the planting season you work and one person will be left at home to be cooking for the ones in the field it was it was a thing that happened within the family and then between households people when they were cultivating because the fields are, 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 are they large so you'd need even if you do have enough kids you need to work with your neighbor you go work together you help each other other during harvesting and then we, um also during um after harvesting then you go together to sell so there were those good um relations between households you knew that um your neighbor you work together but now things had changed and um they also mentioned on now that if you were to still cultivate you the one that is not cultivating but has livestock is not going to care if their livestock goes to raid um your field but before even if they didn't have a fence the fact that everyone was cultivating they made sure there was someone heading the livestock far away from the field but now people didn't care and it caused a lot of conflict um between households and then the cultural impact um it, it, the respondents noted that during the harvesting seasons there was um a cultural event that would happen um to celebrate one that has that received the most harvest and then you'd all meet the at the chief's homestead you also will be exchanging um if someone else had more maize and then you had more pumpkin then you could um exchange within each other which will help you also get a variety a variety that you didn't have and then also um cultivation in the in these rural areas is also part of um identity because um there are certain crops that you know that as a closer person you you eat you know we have a mifino we have umka that you know that during that time everyone is going to be eating and enjoying it but now it's no longer there even if you go home now with my grandmother in the rural areas it's not the it, like it, it used to be part of us but 
those things have changed. Now we are adopting to uh, more modern ways and the, the elders are feeling like um, our identity and our culture, we are letting um, go of them. And then the health consequences, um, during the time when it was if they were cultivating, actively cultivating, they noted that you could um, have a lot of vegetables in one dish. Um, you'd have your spinach, your cabbage, if you like, your carrot, and whatever. But now, the main food was the was was starch. So, and this is where they indicated that they have seen prevalence of diseases and they believe that it's because they're not eating as healthy as they used to be um, when they were actively cultivating. So um, we did have respondents in two of um, both villages in the Eastern Cape. They, were, they said that they were not planning to return to cultivation and this was because they um they indicated that they don't plan because of their old age and they don't see the youth taking up farming at all while the other ones in the kwazulu natal province they had a sense of optimism that you no know, eventually the youth will see you know there's there's no employment so they will eventually want to do something for themselves so they did see that um, in their villages, maybe cultivation would um, be taken up again. But they did indicate that in order for that to happen, they need support, particularly fencing, which was a very big issue. They say that this one is crucial because um, it, it protects, it would protect their, their crops and then um, without proper fencing, their efforts, it, that they put into cultivations are undermined, um, leading to potential losses, and this discourages um, them as farmers. And other areas of support included cheap and accessible input, and then access to water, and um, the presence of agricultural advisors, because some of, of these, for instance, inputs, some, some farmers do get them but because agricultural advisors are not really visible and the people don't know the processes to take in order for them to apply for this input so they were like if maybe they could be more available and then they advise us on on the ways in which we can go about maybe we can even apply for the fencing and then maybe the youth would want to do something and then um they also emphasize on the importance of having access to affordable fertilizers and tractors, particularly on the fertilizers, because back when, before the betterment planning, which is which is the separation, the trial was also here, which is where you keep your livestock. So they could use trial manure to um, fertilize the, uh, the, uh, the place where they were cultivating. But now it's so far, it needs so much effort, even if you're gonna use it. And they, were, they also felt like the land doesn't respond the same anymore. So it, it would be nice to receive those. So um, we observed that with um, this, people have shifted to home gardens over 70%. And even though it wasn't a practice for others that was done yearly, some would skip a year or two because of financial constraints, but there were those that made sure that they were planting throughout the year, every year, and just to supplement for their household food needs. So the benefits of um, home gardens that were mentioned was that these ones are smaller, so they allow you, even if you have, um, you don't have enough money, you could buy a little and then be able to cultivate and get something. And then also with um, the fact that we said females are usually busy with other household chores. So home gardens, because they're here, they in, they're usually in front of the homestead. So you are able, while you're doing something else, you can go irrigate, you can go plant because it's a small area and it's close by. So it was you are able to integrate your other chores, it, it, it also becomes a household chore as well. So um, in conclusion, 
the study finding shed light on the key factors that are contributing to field abandonment in the um, study areas, which included age, the distance, and um, the economic factors were that there's no job, people didn't have money, and there was lack of fencing. And then um, despite abandonment, the respondents value um, farming because it ensures their food security, which is why there were those that said, we want to, we wish to return to field cultivation. And they were those that um, kept up with cultivation because of, um, by, by um, continuing with gardening. So um, abandoning fields, we've seen that it carries substantial consequences for the village household, economic status and food security. So, um, and this leads to um, sufficient cash needs because they, they, the cash that they have, it, it doesn't um, cover everything that they need for the household. So thank you very much for listening.